into, let's say, L2 of R. Okay? Um, with piecewise linear functions, so with EI, uh, the, the first, the ith coordinate goes to the, indica uh, the <coughs> indicator function of the interval I over M, so M is n to the one third, and say I minus one over M. So I minus one over an I over M, right? Let's make it half open or something. And then you have to, for this to be an L2 isomorphism, you have to multiply this by root M, maybe. Okay? So this is a way of embedding Rn. And, and if you do this embedding, then of course there is a, you have, with this embedding, you've also embedded the operator. So the operator will then act on these piecewise linear functions. Okay? Uh, <coughs> So, so now at least these things live in the same space, but there's still this problem that uh, <laughs> they, they, they act on completely different functions. Okay? The same space, but different functions. This guy acts on, uh, this guy acts on uh, um, functions that are piecewise linear, right? In fact, piecewise constant, not piecewise linear. And this one acts on ones that have second derivatives. So there, there's basically, the intersection is zero, I think, or something. Constant functions, that's the intersection. But it turns out that this is not a problem for actual operator convergence, because what you can do is, um, so these, these, these operators are both kind of nasty. But both of them have, you can define for them uh, inverses. Okay. Let's assume that there is no zero eigenvalue. If there is a zero eigenvalue, then you define a resolvent. So you subtract some constant, and you can subtract a co complex constant. It doesn't matter. And you take the inverse. And it turns out that this, uh, the, the, the resolvent of this, or the inverse of this, is a compact operator. So actually, it's defined on the whole L2 of R. The inverse of that you can also define as a compact operator. So it will define on the whole L2 of R. And those things are going to be, and, and the statement is that those things you can couple in a way that, that, their, that the, the, their difference in norm is going to zero. Okay? So that, that's the precise statement. Okay, so let's call this Hn. I'm going to call this H infinity. And, and I'm going to say it's like this, so it's just going to be kind of schematics. So h and inverse minus h infinity inverse in norm. Uh, and this can be operator norm. So say 2 to 2 norm is going to 0. Okay? And this notion is called norm resolvent convergence uh, for operators. And it implies a lot of things. That's the nice thing about it. It implies that, you know, it, it implies that the, the eigenvalues converge. Okay? Not only the eigenvalues converge, but the eigenvectors, uh, you know, if, the, if there are distinct eigenvectors in the limit, then the eigenvectors of the, uh, the approximating things converge in norm to the limiting eigenvectors. So everything beautiful that you want to know is, is in it. And it's a simple statement. And often, these kind of statements can have simple proofs. So, so in, no, in this particular case, actually, the proof is not that simple. But in other cases, the proof is very simple. And, and then you get a huge amount of interesting information out of some simple proof just by working at this slightly more abstract level. Okay. Two to two norms. So, so, you know, it's the maximum norm of what you take, what it takes in a L2 ball of radius one. Maximal to norm. Uh, yeah. This is also called the operator norm. <coughs> Doesn't that show that the. So this is the large value value of this thing, and the small value value of the thing in front of it? So, almost, uh, but that's not how it works. So, the, uh, let me tell you, yeah, that's a good question. So, the eigenvalues. 
So, so you can imagine what the eigenvalues of the area operator are going to look like, because they're the limit of the eigenvalues of the random matrix. So those are the eigenvalues that are near the boundary. Okay, so, so uh, the, 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 the tradition in this kind of, so these are like random Schrodinger operator. This is a kind of continuous random Schrodinger operator. The tradition here is, and that's why we took a minus sign here, is to make them almost positive definite, in the sense that, well, they're bounded from below. Okay, so this is not positive definite. If you erase the noise, it is positive definite. That's just the area operator. Where multiplication by x is positive and minus second derivative is the square of uh, the first derivative. Right. Am I doing it right? What? OK. Yeah, minus second derivative is the square, square of the first. OK. Well, you figure this out. So, 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 that, so that's, that, that's, that's the precise statement. OK. Um, uh, and let me see. So in the remaining time, I want to tell you first about you know, how we think about this. So you, know, you could say, well, OK, I have this, I have this operator. But, and I have this convergence, it's very nice, but what is it good for? The point is that this is extremely useful. So it's a very nice representation of the top eigenvalue, of which you can read off a lot of things in a very simple way. Okay? And uh, uh, so, so let's start with the, the area operator. Okay? Um, one thing I didn't tell you is that I have to set a boundary condition here. Okay. And the boundary condition is Dirichlet. Okay, so what is the area of our area operator? There is just minus del, del 2 plus x. Right? So what do we know about this operator? So you have seen the airy function, right? So there, uh, I'm sure if you, whenever you do any kind of random matrix like thing, you always see the airy function. So you probably have seen the Wikipedia page of the airy function. So there's the airy AI and BI functions. And, <coughs> and The area a, bi function that, grow, that blows up near infinity. So if you want to have a solution of this, right? So, so apply, take, take this and apply some f, as, and let's say that you just want it to be equal to 0. Okay, well, you can solve it. There, there are going to be two linearly independent solutions, right? And, and, and those are these things, the two linearly independent solutions. Every solution is a linear combination of those two. But let's say that you put here lambda f, right? So you want to find some other eigenvalue of this operator. Well, you can put your lambda into the x, move it over there, so x minus, whatever. So, so what you see is that, is that all the solutions are going to be just shifts. For all these lambdas, they're just going to be the shifts of the ai and bi functions. OK? So if this guy has any eigenvalues whatsoever, uh, they cannot have a bi component because that goes exponentially, uh, actually super exponentially to infinity. So it just has to be a shift of the ai. Okay. And the ai decays exponentially. So, so in fact, as long as the shift of the ai satisfies the boundary condition, it's going to be an eigenfunction. Okay. Uh, so, so the ai function, you've probably seen this thing. Uh, looks something like this, it decays, and then, and then it does stuff like this here. Oscillates, oscillates faster and faster. Uh, it, it grows, I think, like fourth root or square root or something, but oscillates faster. In fact, if you want to see the, um, the k0 uh, is, is, okay, is approximately uh, let's, uh, 
is approximately uh, minus some constant times uh, x to the um, sorry k k to the two thirds. Okay, so so the, the zeros, if you go that way, gets dense, get dense. Um, so what are going to be the eigenfunctions? Well, it's very simple. You just take this ai function um, and shift. Okay, and the eigenvalue because I erase this thing, but the eigenvalue is just going to be the amount that you have shifted. Okay, so 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 the first eigenvalue is the first zero, the second eigenvalue is the second zero, and so on. Okay, so we already know that lambda k is approximately c times k to the th two thirds. Now there are general theorems that if you have a, a random Schrodinger operator which looks like this, this plus some potential, and it's on the half line, then if this thing grows the right way, then it has a discrete spectrum. Okay. So, so from that theorems, you can just say, well, this thing, also, this guy has a discrete spectrum. These are the these are the eigenvalues. Or they, they behave like this. It's not exactly. It's just approximately. Uh, in fact, the proper answer is that the eigenvalues are minus the area a i zeros, and the eigenfunctions are just these a i's shifted and normalized. Okay. So very simple. Mm. Now, let's say that you want to have um, you want to have asymptotics for not the airy eigenvalues, but for the airy beta eigenvalues. Okay? I shouldn't be doing this, but... So, right, so um, you'd like to see that this, this operator also has a discrete spectrum and behaves somehow similarly to the array. Okay. And here's what you can do. Um, okay, so, so here is a, a nice lemma that you can prove. We may do it today or tomorrow is the following. So you can look at the Airy beta operator. Okay, let me just, just denote it like this. Okay, then this can be upper bounded and lower bounded. Okay, uh, so for every epsilon, the following is true. Uh, you can upper bound it by one plus epsilon times the area operator plus the identity times some random constant, and Lorne barred this by the, the same way. 1 minus epsilon times the area operator, minus the identity times some random constant. Airy beta is the stochastic area operator. Okay? So this is a random operator, and you have this bound. Okay, so what does this mean? This means positive definite order, right? So if you take the difference of them as operators, then, then it will be positive definite. The constant C is dependent on the noise, exactly. That's the only place that the noise comes in. Okay, so this, not, uh, this tells you everything you want to know. We'll prove this, it's not hard. In fact, it follows from the fact that this operator, B prime, okay, is less than or equal to Epsilon times 1 plus epsilon a plus some ran random constant times i. Okay, so multiplication by noise uh, is, 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 is behaves nicely this way. Now we will prove this, right? If you if you use this, uh, the difference between the area beta and the area is just b prime. Okay, just this multiplication by b prime. So as long as this is small, then you get automatically a domination of this kind. Mm 
Well, that's, that's, that's exactly the question. So the answer is yes. So for example, it, it, it holds for the top eigenvalue. Why? Well, you, just use, you can use the real quotient formula. All right? So the top eigenvalue is a soup over all functions of length one, of the length one, of the, uh, you know, the quadratic form you make out of this, uh, evaluated at that function. Right? You can put that definition through these inequalities. And you get that. And if you use Kuran Fisher, which characterizes the second eigenvalue, you do the same. You get, you get automatically that. So in fact, this implies that, right? So this implies that uh, the same inequality uh, applies for kth eigenvalue for every k. Exactly the same inequality as applies for the operator applies, applies, applies for the kth eigenvalue. So just this simple fact gives you this asymptotics. Okay. So for every beta, the so this is some fact about the ARI process, which is, you know, you can prove it with determinants for beta equals two. You can prove it with Fafians for beta equals one, or you can prove it like this. Um, well, I'll, get, I'll show you a proof, and then we figure out. It's uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. So, I have to tell you what functions we're going to apply this operator for. And for, for, for what we did here, I will have to <clears throat> I have to also tell you uh, what the quadratic forms are, right? The quadratic forms have to be, has to be figured out. So, so we define the norm, uh, I call L star norm. Okay, so F norm star, okay? It's just a, uh, it's just, let's just call this the, L, the L2 norm of F. So we need an L2 norm component plus the ARI norm of F. Okay? So that's just F AF. Okay? And, and, well, you know how to define this. And this one is just the integral of F prime squared. Right? It's the L2 norm of F, F prime. Uh, okay? So maybe that's just by integration by parts from the, the from from here, All right? So maybe write it like that. So this is the L two norm of f prime plus the L two norm of f times root x squared. Hmm? Okay, so so this is the L two S term of f. You can define it for every function. Uh, unless the derivative doesn't exist, but if, it, if that's say, then it's, we say this L star norm is infinite. Okay, so, so those, that's this function space we're gonna work in, the ones that have L star norm, finite L star norm. Okay, and, 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 and already, in order to work with this operator, we have to be able to say what is, so we need uh, to, to compute F, a beta f, right? Uh, how did I put it down? A beta f uh, for beta uh, for f in L star. F comma a f, yeah. A is just the ordinary area operator. Oh. It's a, so you don't take you don't take the norm of AF, you take F comma AF. That's why that's why you have this square root, right? Um, okay. So this is already not a trivial thing, right? Because you uh, I mean let's see, so Um, 
sorry, what is your question? So where does L-star live in the history of math? Okay, uh, I can tell you that now, but this is, you know, don't ask me. There are much better people to tell you that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, so let me. <clears throat> So the only thing that we need to define, of course, is f, d prime f, right? Because this thing is just, this is just equal to f a f plus, plus f d prime f. Okay? So, you know, at this point you could just say, that this is the Paley integral okay, of, of f with respect to Brownian motion. But you have to be, but, but, but you know, you, you should be able to define this also for f's that are depending on b prime. So, so there should be a way to do it without actually using any stochastic integration. Stochastic integration is, is messy. Uh, so, so, <clears throat> So there is a, a way to define it, and uh, here, here is how it goes. Okay, so, right, so, so you, you want to understand this as integral of f prime, f, f squared, b prime, dx. Right, that's what it should be equal to. So you could try to do integration by parts. Um, you could do this is f squared prime, so f prime to f prime f, right, and b dx. Um, so this now is a perfectly fine integral. Excuse me? Minus sign, thanks. Okay, so this one is a perfectly fine integral, except you may not, you know, because b is now just a function, f prime exists and f exists, so everything's nice, but it may not converge. Um, okay, so, so to control this, you would like to control this somehow, right? In particular, you'd like to control in terms of in terms of this uh, a, um, okay, um, so that's an exciting thing to do, which we'll do next time. Uh, but the main idea, just just before I stop, let me show you is that as you write b as as the average of b uh, plus b tilde. Okay, so what is b? The average of b is the integral of, uh, of t to t plus 1 of b of s ds. So just average on an interval of length 1. Um, so this is going to be a very nice function because it's... <coughs> let me see. So the average is it will have a derivative, which is itself a function. Okay. Um, and this one, on the other hand, uh, which is the remaining of the average, is going to be small. So there is a smooth part and there is a sm small part. Okay. So, so, so we will be able to use this, this separation to uh, actually give bounds in terms of, and growth of these things, because we have, we have some growth bounds on these. Um, to to show uh, to show this inequality over there. Okay, so so that's what I'll do next. Thanks. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so, so basically if you, uh, the simplest thing is if you, you can check that if you have an f which is an eigenfunction for the finite operator, um, then it will, has to be small in the beginning. And it comes from the, how the boundary is at the finite operator. Um, so, um, you remember that, actually it just comes from this very top entry here. So if you look at J, then you have this chi, you have this chi and you have zero here. Okay? So it comes from this zero, well not zero, you have this A, A but it's small, right? This is normal, which this is small. So this is big, 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 small. If you put here, uh, if you put here a root n, uh, then you'll have Neumann conditions. So, uh, in the in the discrete case, in this convergence, this is a general fact, by the way, about difference equation approximating differential equations. Is that is that in the discrete case, there you never have boundary conditions, but but the way you operate these entries at the boundary will actually give you boundary conditions in the limit. Um, 